Arthur, you heard me. All that's left to do is sign the paperwork. I was speaking to my wife, Annie, who I had been married to for more than 25 years. I strained to hear her voice, but it got progressively quieter the longer someone continued to rant about me. Everything began this afternoon. I got home from work. She had a determined look on her face as she sat at the table with a glass of wine. Unfortunately, though, she was only allowed to have one glass, and because things were becoming problematic, she drank from it. She didn't believe I would enjoy it or that, considering how the talk was going, I may want a drink. When I sat down, I knew it was going to be awful. I was asked how my day went by her. She informed me straight away that she was divorcing me and that he had discovered her true love. She found someone to make her heart sing that I could never match and I was no longer worthy of her affections. I had a hard time hearing her. The issue was that everything seemed quieter and quieter to me as her voice grew louder. Ours was a quite ordinary story. After meeting in high school, Annie and I remained friends. Sally, our daughter, was born roughly half a year after our marriage. We didn't get married for her, but it was on the schedule for today. Despite not being wealthy, we both had decent careers. We belonged to the upper middle class, I think. A few years prior, we had paid off our house and had a respectable savings account. We often talked about how much we loved one another, how often we went on family vacations, and how, even though our intimacy wasn't as great when we first got married, we still had it. I imagined we would grow old together and we loved one another very much, on average, a couple of times a week up until this point. It continued to rant. She kept telling me what was happening, her face growing hot. Arthur, Arthur, give me a look. I turned to face her since it was getting harder for me to focus. These documents need to be signed by you. She went on, gesturing to the papers in front of me. I tried to focus, but her demanding voice was difficult to hear. It appeared as though the room's colors and light had faded, despite the fact that the kitchen light was on. I was upset in my mind, but my body did not respond. And the longer I remained silent, the angrier I got. I can't remember anything but Annie smacking me. I was not affected by it. All I could think was that my face would be permanently scarred crimson. Still, I was unable to move in. The world was getting darker and darker. The day was quite exhausting. There was an accident at the university that forced the postponement of classes, we were sent home when the electricity went off. I was unable to make sense of what was happening. The house was awfully silent when I arrived home. All of the lights were on. There was my mother's car, but not my father's. I tossed my books and bag onto a chair as soon as I walked into the kitchen. The father was seated at the table. He remained still. All he did was stare off into space. My dad was staring at an almost empty glass of my mother's wine, and there was an open bottle on the other side of the table a pile of documents bearing several sign-here inscriptions. I approached my father and put my hand on his shoulder from behind. Salutations, Dad. I thought he would turn around, but he remained motionless. I couldn't help but gasp as I turned to gaze at his face. His eyes clouded over, turning nearly white, as though tears were streaming out of them. He didn't blink, though. His mouth opened and a stream of spit spilled across his lap. Panic struck me. Papa! Papa! Awaken! Papa! A minute later, I was crying uncontrollably. Bad still remained silent. I knew I had to get over this. Sally, slow down, I implored myself. Daddy requires assistance. I took out my phone and dialed 911. I told them straight out that I was not going to get my father, Arthur Smith, in response. I gave them my name when they asked for my address and other details. Sally Smith's address at home. They promised to send me an ambulance and it would show up in roughly ten minutes. I sat for the next few minutes, holding my dad's hand and staring at him. I told him in hushed tones that everything would be all right. Growing up, this dad offered me everything. Despite his busy schedule, he was a constant at my school. Ballet, musicals, and events. He would suffer from the screeching in my ear for hours on end when I was first beginning to play the violin. But he would always cheer me on. At last, he saved up enough cash to purchase a higher-quality signed violin for my 16th birthday. It wasn't too horrible. Though not optimal, it surpassed my previous practice. Violins. After five years, I was studying music at university, specializing on violin and strings. Although I owned two superior violins, this one held a particular place in my heart as my father had given it to me. I had no idea what to do. I held out. Why was Dad acting in this way? What took place? 
Moreover, I didn't know where Mom was. I looked over the documents at that point, and the phrase, Petition for Divorce, drew my attention. How come? After reading the document's first page in a matter of minutes, I had, for no apparent reason, goosebumps all down my spine. My mother desired my father's divorce. It seems highly probable that these documents were the source of Dad's illness. And by the way Mom's wine was opened, it seemed like she gave Dad the paperwork and walked out. People are frequently taken aback by how rapidly emotions may shift. I don't think they've ever experienced this before. I had the impression that all empathy and the need to be with my mother had vanished a little after that. An ambulance showed up. After putting Dad on a stretcher, they drove him to the hospital. I started calling after I locked the home since I was driving behind. I made calls to my dad's best buddy, his sister Rhonda, his mom, and my grandma while I was on my way. Subsequently, she informed his manager at work that her father would be absent for some time. I informed them that he was unconscious and en route to the hospital when I arrived home. Everyone urged me to keep them informed about his illness, and his manager promised to let their boss know and set up an emergency leave for dad. I was furious with her and knew I was putting off the next call, but I had to contact my mother. After a few rings, the phone rang and she answered it. Hi, my love, Sally. What kind of day did you have? Whoa. Just, whoa. My mother, of course, was not so gullible as to believe that I would be unaware of what was happening. I found Dad Mom on my agenda when I came inside the house almost an hour ago, and from the moment she realized I was already at home, she learned everything. Mom, where are you? She stopped talking, unwilling to say anything. I sensed her reluctance. Put another way, you just ruined my dad, your partner, and went away from him, not giving a damn? No, sweetheart. I tried to tell your father what was going on and about porn, but he didn't respond, so I decided it would be better to part ways and let him know that our time together is coming to an end. She made an effort to sound casual, but having discovered dad the way I did, it was highly likely that he had watched as she had simply tore his heart out and tossed it at the wall. If my estimation was right, you left him behind when he needed assistance. Are you truly that cold-hearted? Are you aware of the current events or are you indifferent to them? A hint of anger crept into my voice. Don't be angry just yet, sweetie. It may come as a surprise to some, but your dad will be all right. While Paul waits to marry me, all I shall ask for is what is mine and a little help. Indeed. My mother is no longer grounded in reality. Wicked. Mom, you haven't seen me upset yet. And just so you know, I'm currently en route to the hospital to pick up my dad. In the ambulance is him. And he appeared to have suffered a stroke when I arrived home. I'm sad to hear this, Sally, my dear. However, not a but, Mom. May I ask who this is, Paul? The Paul from your job who you have been talking about will be there. She paused. Yes, sweetheart. My mother's constant talker about Paul came from her work. I understand that he is twelve years your junior. How long have you been seeing him for an affair? She paused once more. Half a year. You've been having intimate relations with someone from your workplace behind your father's back for the past six months. You concealed your relationship with your lover from Dad and me through lies. I didn't know you were a mother. Apparently Dad didn't either, based on the condition you recently left him in. How in the hell did you think this would make any of us happy? Well, maybe not at first. But you'll realize we were meant to be together as soon as we move in with Paul. It was the second time she had said it in the plural. Did she really believe I was going to move in with her and her boyfriend and leave my dad? I thought I was boiling over with rage. If I didn't stop, I knew I would say something stupid. Before I say something to you that I might not be able to take back, I'm going to hang up immediately. However, allow me to be crystal clear. I'm not going to move away from Daddy, and there's not a chance in hell that I'll go near Paul, much less his place where you were with him. No matter how angry you are, I am your mother, Sally Smith, and you will not talk to me like Way. I believe that ends our conversation. And before she could say another word, I hung up. If she believed that I would support her actions. She was insane. She made multiple attempts to return my call. Then she began phoning my dad's phone, which was dumb since I don't think he would have answered your call even if he had it. Since I had my dad's phone, I didn't answer any of her calls. When I arrived at the hospital, dad had already been admitted by the ambulance staff and was being monitored in the designated room. When Aunt Rhonda arrived, she informed me that my mother had also called a few times, 
but she didn't know anything more that her brother was in the hospital. Rhonda blushed so much that I thought I could practically see Steve emerge from hers when I told her what had happened. Do you possess the paperwork I gave my brother, Sally? Naturally. Not only is Aunt Rhonda here my aunt, but she also works as our family attorney. So we sat next to Dad for an hour while Rhonda made notes and perused the paperwork, muttering curse words now and then. Periodically, nurses and doctors would come and go from the room to see how Dad was doing. The unfortunate news is that your father's marriage will end with your mother's divorce. This has been going on for more than two months, as the timeline presented here demonstrates. It should have been submitted this week, otherwise it would have cost her significantly more than the expenses her legal team charged. I gave a shrug. Because of what my mother did, I had all the justifications in the world. I want no dad to be with her anymore. It was peculiar. Never was I a daddy's girl. Despite the nasty nature of my mother's conduct, I always looked up to her. Her soulmate, Paul, pulled it off. Rhonda went on. Mom and dad should never again be together, no matter what. The good news is that she chose to be represented by a dishonest attorney. It will cost her a lot of money to get a divorce from him. The case is taken to court in large part. She grinned. On the other hand, my beloved brother will receive a 100% family discount and has the greatest attorney in the area. That night was the first time we had ever smiled at each other. Furthermore, some of her claims, which include the demands for 60% of the financial assets and 50% of the house's funds, in addition to spousal and child maintenance, are undoubtedly ludicrous. Based on your response, I'm going to assume that you do not intend to move home with your mother. I gave a head shake. Excellent. Excellent. Although I have some preliminary ideas, we should wait a day to observe how your father fares. Because of her abandonment of him, your mother might already be in danger or even charged with mental abuse. The days that followed passed quickly as physicians checked on Dad non-stop. He was well and in good physical condition, but he was simply non-responsive. I studied while holding a laptop and a textbook in a hospital headed by the band. Occasionally, a family member would stop by to provide me a respite. After that, I would go home, change into new clothes, and return. Admittedly, I sobbed a lot during my time alone myself at home. The owner of the business where Dad was employed came to see how he was doing, which was one of the major surprises. I knew Tom, his manager, but I had never met his boss. Unexpected. She was the one. Tina Williams was a beautiful, sensuous, thin woman with dark raven hair, tanned skin, and blue eyes that glittered, maybe making some women drool and every man alive. It turns out that a few years ago, when Tina went through a difficult divorce, my dad was part of the group at work that supported her. Before her father introduced her to Aunt Rhonda, her unfaithful ex-husband attempted to seize her daughter, the majority of their savings, and nearly half of her business. By turning the tables, Rhonda made sure Tina never had to give up any ownership stake in her company and made sure she was paid child support for their daughter, who was six years old at the time. Tina visited multiple times and was taken aback when I gave her the broad rundown of what transpired and the reason he was in the hospital. She would sit with him, hold his hand, and tell him stories about work that had transpired while he was abroad. She would also bring cards from all of Dad's projects. It came to light that my father was the office life of the party, with everyone enthralled with his antics. I should mention that Dad works for one of the financial organizations that assist banks in processing payments to financial institutions. He is an accountant by trade. Although my dad's profession can be physically demanding, it seems like he makes everyone's workday a little happier. About two weeks later in the afternoon, I had just come back from home when I went inside the room. Tina and Rhonda were coming to the end of their talk. It was a little heated, I could tell, but they were mad at my mother, not at each other. In a letter to Tina, my mother insisted that she be granted access to all of Dad's incentives. The fact that the money had already been paid over the previous few years was irrelevant. In the letter, she threatened to sue Tina unless she received 50% of the money in a designated bank account within 30 days. Other than the absurdity of requesting money that has already been paid, given that they froze all of their joint assets while Arthur was receiving treatment, it appears that she and her new partner are certain to have money. With an extremely sly smile, Rhonda said, 
I let out a giggle and made myself known. Indeed, my mother sent me a message this morning for the first time in the past two weeks, the text message requesting money from me. I was incredibly angry at her behavior, so I chose not to respond. Since I informed her what she did to him over the past few weeks, she hasn't really inquired about the terrible ones. Tina is now rather concerned about my father's emotions. Her eyes would narrow, and her speech would get obtuse whenever my mother was brought up, expressing how much she despised her. The appearance of flames around the periphery of those blazing eyes was almost palpable. All I want is for her to never have to spend time in a room with my mom. I thought she might set it on fire. Even though I don't love my mother as much as I used to, she was still my mother. She ruined the most amazing individual. Sally, I wouldn't have my business or my Clarissa if it weren't for your father. During one of the worst times in my life, a lot of people at the office supported me. However, your father listened to me for a long while. He didn't ever hold me or my ex-husband up. He simply let me rant. Really, no one has ever done this without sharing their thoughts. He got the media involved in seeing to it that I was taken care of. Should he be a solitary man? After the divorce, I would give it everything I had to pursue him. I smiled and gave a shrug of my shoulders. Well, you'll be by yourself shortly. Their faces showed realization as a result. Tina grinned and Rhonda giggled. I'm grateful, Sally. I required it. I still find it hard to believe your mother discarded such a lovely man or what she did to him. I need to head to the workplace, but let me do this first. Tina approached my father and, with Rhonda and me looking on, leaned in to give him a tender yet heartfelt kiss on the lips. She turned to face us and smiled, but a moment later, when my dad moaned, her grin changed to one of shock. Upon waking, I felt pliable, my lips, the perfect amount of force. Behind them was a necessary and kind desire that expressed a fondness I hadn't experienced in a long time. The sound of medical equipment beeping reached my ears and I heard myself moan, practically every muscle in my body hurting. After such a gentle kiss, I expected any to be standing over my bed when I opened my eyes. But Tina was there, grinning, just standing there. Tina. Rhonda and Sally emerged from the opposite side of the bed. Daddy, it's all right. You will be all right with everything. Hear me out? A second later, my memories finally caught up with me, and I understood Annie was going to leave me, or had probably already. What has taken place? The three of them told me over the next few minutes how Sally had called for an ambulance after realizing I was not breathing, how Annie had cheated on me for several months according to divorce papers she had found. How? After Rhonda stopped Tina's funds until they discovered what was going on with me, Annie threatened Tina. For what duration? Arthur, two weeks, Rhonda responded. I gave Tina a look. Tina, have you given me a kiss? Tina reddened. Indeed, apologies. I was saying my goodbyes and heading back to the office. I grinned. No, everything is in order. Since I'm already in the market, I believe it's acceptable. In the ensuing many hours. I underwent MRIs, blood tests, and examinations by multiple doctors. Tina, who was a psychologist decided not to go to the office and instead stayed here with Rhonda and the other doctors who came to see her. I informed them that Annie had informed me she was divorcing me when I caught her drinking by herself at home. Then I told them that the world started to get less colorful as she started to step up the assault. Both the sound and the light vanished, and even though I wanted to move, it was difficult for me. Anybody smacking me in the face and yelling at me was the last thing I remember but her statements were beyond my comprehension. When the females realized Ian was beating me, they all gasped at the same time, when I was unable to reply. When do you think this happened, Dad? It was probably around five. Sweetheart, how come you require this information, since I arrived home around half seven and discovered you? Mom must have left you there by yourself for a considerable amount of time, I suppose. The psychologist stepped forward to help. It's common for someone in your circumstances to be mistreated in silence. In your situation, I would say that upon hearing your wife declare her intention to leave you, you experienced some shock. Naturally, this is a far more extreme instance than we typically encounter. However, it makes logic. When Arthur was younger, Rhonda talked. He was bullied by someone who was a few years his senior. He made fun of Arthur a lot, and one day one of the neighborhood parents discovered him unconscious in the park. 
Our parents told me that after they put him to bed, he woke up the following morning. Since he woke up the following day at the same time as normal, no one ever gave it much attention. However, it did indeed occur. I gave a nod. In the park, Billy used to tease and push me. After a while, my memory of what transpired fades. However, my parents informed me that I had passed out and that someone had brought me home when I woke up. They went and spoke with Billy's parents after I told them about him. Billy approached me at school the following day to apologize. I laughed at the thought. He never harassed me again after that day, though I don't think it was sincere. The psychologist said, I think we may have some repetition here. The mind is still not well understood in many aspects. But if this kind of thing has happened before, it makes plausible that it might occur once more. I scowled. He grinned. I wouldn't worry excessively. With the warmth and care that these three exquisite women have shown, even if the same incident occurs again, I believe that you will receive excellent care. After a few more minutes of conversation, he excused himself and walked out. I was also worn out. I sent the three girls home to get some rest, telling them they could come check on me tomorrow. I know this may sound unusual to someone who hasn't slept in the last two weeks, but I was exhausted. I came back to life throughout the next two days. Tina offered me some easy assignments to complete and brought along her business laptop to keep me busy. Rhonda came over mostly to show me the updated divorce documents and to get my signature on a few so she could start the process of ending my marriage to Amy. Rhonda had a young detective with her as well, Karen Hill. I was questioned by Detective Hill regarding my experiences with Amy that evening for more than an hour. She said thank you and that Rhonda and I will get her report in a few days. I didn't know if Amy was the target of our complaint. At last, Rhonda instructed me to just let her handle everything. Left after giving me a forehead kiss. I was discharged from the hospital, as Sally had mentioned, in the afternoon of the second day after I woke up, and I went home. I was shocked when Tina met Sally and me outside the office and assisted Sally in walking me to her big SUV. That night, Tina stayed for dinner. We placed a takeaway order. She spent a few hours watching TV with us after helping to clean up, and she turned to walk away. After giving her a hug, Sally made sure I helped her get to her car. I sincerely appreciate everything you have done over the last two weeks, Tina. I'm not sure how I can pay you back, I stated. Well... You may invite me to dinner and dancing when you're relaxed again, which should be in a few weeks. She chuckled. I reddened. The woman whose kiss woke me up in the evening of the second day invited me for a date as soon as I left the hospital this afternoon. But I was going to be a bachelor again shortly, and she was lovely. All right. This means that it will take me nearly two weeks to go back to normal starting Friday night after work. She walked up and gave me a hard embrace after nodding. As it lingered a little longer, I began to see additional subliminal meaning. She entered her vehicle. It amused me that for a few minutes I wondered who this weird woman I had been married to for nearly 25 years was called. Sally, Rhonda, and Tina fussed over me once again during the course of the following few days, making sure I was okay. Being so well taken care of was pleasant, but that Friday afternoon, the news that Rhonda brought me caught us all off guard. She continued, and was arrested this afternoon. What has taken place? I inquired. As a result of your admission to the hospital's police, Annie was placed under arrest on charges of mental cruelty against a disabled person. This is predicated on the reality that you were defenseless and immobile at the moment. She's in serious difficulty when you consider that she abandoned you for an unspecified period of time without supervision or assistance. How does this affect getting a divorce? Ask Tina, who came to supper with us once more. Clarice, her eight-year-old daughter, watched a Disney film in the living room with her that evening while we chatted. On Monday, I was going back to work so Tina could meet me there. But I was starting to think she needed more than the fish when it came to doing the office math. I couldn't help but wonder what was concealed beneath the exquisite, form-fitting attire she wore on her visits. Rhonda grinned. This suggests that things will most likely work out well for Arthur. I insist on a 50-50 share, based on the condition of the house's bank accounts. Given everything that transpired, I'm sure there was more we could have done. But I think Arthur will want to be just. I gave a nod. Furthermore, none of the bonus money she attempted to obtain from you will be accessible to him. Tina, 
I also brought claims of mental cruelty against her in my lawsuit. All this will accomplish is prevent her from touching objects that are not hers. She will probably make her appearance in a few days. She won't notice anywhere at all and will be able to go back to her pixel need. My goal is to swiftly finalize the divorce by taking advantage of Arthur's hospital visit. After that, I have plans, depending on her response. I'll see to it that Arthur doesn't lose anything needless, she grinned. How much time will the divorce take then? Aunt Sally inquired. I think everything is moving along nicely. Approximately three months should pass. If Amy desires to engage in combat, it will take longer if I bring in the big guns. But the pain to her will be immense. I was tending to the automobile that evening as I walked. Clarice was assisted by Sally into the rear seat. Tina gave me another hug and gave me a quick kiss, which made me think of how I felt when I got up the other day. Arthur, I won't rush things because I know you're a trustworthy person and you're married. But before I tell you that I desire you, I want to clean you. I've wanted you for a very long time, of course. However, I would never be unfaithful to someone or pursue a married man. Even if their marriage is disintegrating, I don't want it to happen to anyone else because it happened to me. I took a minute to look into her deep blue eyes, brushing a strand of her dark raven hair out of her face before leaning in to give her a kiss. However, I let the kiss to be intense for maybe thirty seconds rather than tender and gentle. I knew that we had a connection. When I pulled away, Tina's eyes were closed and her tongue was running over my lips as she enjoyed her kiss. I smiled. To let you know that I affirm your rights, please accept this. We pivoted to observe the girls. They were both laughing as they saw our kiss. As Teen and Clarissa pulled out of the driveway, Sally had a big, goofy smile on her face, and Clarissa was clapping her hands. When we waved, Sally gave me a hug. The following several months were quite an experience. On the one hand, everyone wanted their divorce to end soon. She, however, was not pleased with this arrangement. After all these years of marriage, she had to realize on some level that Paul was in charge and that she should receive the majority of the assets and defend her garbage. With each absurd demand for a settlement, Rhonda called Annie's attorney once, and all opposition to the settlement vanished overnight, but I'm not sure what was stated. Every Friday night, Tina and I got together while Sally took up the responsibility of watching for Clarice after school, allowing me to enjoy dinner, sip coffee, watch a show, or go dancing. We never did anything but hold hands and kiss, of course. However, I sensed that the night of my divorce would be apart from the others. When I returned to work, our financial institution was operating smoothly. We weren't in the major leagues, but we turned a healthy profit. Each of us performed our duties. We had a great experience as a group and were fairly compensated for it. I believe the staff came to the realization that Tina and I were starting to date. Everyone was thrilled for us both but I had to curb my typical wild behavior. My supervisor, who answered to Tina, ensured that there was no discussion over her conduct at work. Considering that around three and a half months later, I was essentially meeting with his supervisor. We were informed that the divorce will be formalized beginning on Thursday of the following week. Though there was no trial, everyone asked to speak with one another before the decision was made. We decided that she would visit Sally and me at the house, and I signed on to that the day before. I cooked lamb chops, dumplings, and sauce for the three of us during my day off. We all three loved this dish, so I thought it would help ease the awkwardness of our evening chats. About 5 p.m., Sally arrived home and changed and had a shower. Then, right before 6 o'clock, Annie was at the front door answering the doorbell. I may now describe Danny even if I haven't done so previously. A few months ago, before everything fell apart, and he was a forty-something gorgeous housewife. She had dark hair, a curvaceous physique, and short shoulder length. Even if her weight was a few pounds over what she preferred, she was in fifth place, but she still had a beautiful bust and was really lovely. Although the woman in front of me was quite attractive, she was essentially unrecognizable. Annie had become extremely overweight. She had huge, thick cheeks and jowls, her tummy, which had always protruded slightly, now draped over her trousers in that voluptuous mother. The fifth spot, which I cherished, was enormously enlarged. In addition, her loose clothing concealed her physical fitness. Although I have nothing against overweight ladies, I felt that her physique was shockingly displayed in this picture. Annie flinched, but saw nothing. Hello, Annie, 
Please enter. I offered her a drink of wine as we entered the kitchen, and she accepted. For a few minutes, we talked about trifles. She inquired about my job and whether I was looking after myself. I didn't bother to comment on how she should take care of herself. Instead, I asked her about her employment. That's Paul's desire. He tried to make me put on weight since he didn't like how thin I was. She brought up the unasked question. I scowled for over 25 years. I was in love with this woman, and yet I was still concerned about her health even after what she had done to me. You don't think that's okay? She gave me a look. No, any, not in my case. You were in fantastic, trim, and healthy condition when we were together, but to tell the truth, I'm surprised at how you look. You don't appear good, and I would be really concerned about your health and would attempt to help you if I weren't so hurt by what you did. You don't give a damn, though. Do you also? Her expression fell. Sally and you. Without me here, you're content and in good health. Well, a part of me does give a damn. But I shrugged when you very much abandoned me to perish here. She let out a sigh. I'm worthy of it. Did I really do something horrible? No, dear. It was Sally, fresh out of the shower. You committed an egregious act. You took one lovely family and tore them apart on your own. Then you left the house carefree. I find it incomprehensible that Dad consented to you coming here tonight. Sally, calm down. Your mother is aware of your current situation and how unhappy we are. Coming here must have been a challenge for her. She requested this meeting tonight, so I figured the least we could do was be adults and listen to her. Sally was unhappy, as far as I could tell. She, like me, hadn't spoken with her mother since that fateful day. The way my daughter looked at her mother suggested that this was not going to end well for anyone. It was time to change the subject. I tried to look happy. Difficult conversations aren't ideal on an empty stomach. So let's eat first. So I served dinner. No one spoke, but there were many glances exchanged around the table. Sally simply stared at her mother the entire time. After dinner, I cleared the table and Annie requested to speak with Sally alone first. No way in hell can you say whatever you want in front of both of us. I was surprised, but it was clear that Sally was determined not to be alone with her mother. I believe the look in her eyes matched her mother's when she did this to me that fateful night. She nodded and drew a deep breath. She wanted to do this in front of me, but she looked at Sally instead. Well, Sally, I wanted to ask for your forgiveness for what I did that night. I had all the wrong ideas about this. And no matter what, I don't want to be separated from my daughter indefinitely. Anyone looked at me. There's one more thing, but I'd rather say it in private than in front of your father. Sorry, Mom, but if you can't see both of us, I'd rather not hear it. That was before Annie could do anything else. Sally stood up and left. A moment later, we heard her bedroom door slam. I wished everything would go better and she would sit quietly for herself rather than for me. Overall, I think it went pretty well, I told her. I'm letting her know I heard her. Really? Yes, indeed. I exhaled. Annie, you must understand that right now. Everyone lives in this house, does not like you very much. I began to answer and raised my hand. Let me finish and lay everything out for you first. You had a long-term bad relationship with someone, and you kept it from both Sally and me. Then, unexpectedly, you hand me the divorce papers. And after taking the hit, I'm speechless. You scream, then slap me. And you look like a deer caught in the headlights. Yes. I remember most of that confrontation until you hit me for the first time. Let us now continue. Then you abandon me at some point when you don't react, leaving me there until Sally returns home and finds me insane. Annie appears scared. Now, when Sally calls you, you show no concern for me. When your daughter is clearly concerned about her father, you have never inquired about my health until tonight. You made unreasonable demands of my employer and then walked in here. It is still all about you. You ask Sally for forgiveness, but you never apologize to her. I paused for a moment to see if it would reach her. Yes, Anna. With that said, I believe it went very well and she is now looking at the floor with tears in her eyes. They hadn't hit the ground yet, but they were preparing. I wasn't sure what they were for. Sally, for me it was just about herself, I continued. So our divorce will be finalized tomorrow, and if you don't have anything else to say, I believe we have fulfilled your request for a final meeting. I walked to the door, opened it, and he looked at me before leaving. 
After crossing the threshold, she turned to look at me. Arthur, we've had some really good years, haven't we? Yes, any. Most of our time together was fantastic. You were an excellent lover, a devoted wife, and a loving mother. I'm not sure what that idiot Paul did to you, but the man standing in front of me doesn't resemble the woman I fell in love with. All I see is the last being who was duped into gaining weight like a pig and becoming selfish and unconcerned about those around her. She looked down at her feet again. Do you really mean it, Arthur? Yes. She turned to leave and then turned around one more time. This time, Sheila broke Arthur. Regarding the house and money, Paul said I should ask. So, that was the purpose of this visit. It was not about reuniting with her family. It was only about money. I laughed bitterly and he looked at me, wondering why. Go tell your significant other. Then, at this time tomorrow, you will receive your share of the savings and equity in this house, in the bank account that your lawyer provided to Rhonda Imani. She looked at me. I'm warning you, keep this money away from Paul. Otherwise, you won't have it very long. The final decree was issued the next morning. Andy and I were no longer husband and wife. There was a small amount of sadness, but only a small amount. Mostly, I was pleased. Everyone has had a difficult time over the last few months. I was finally free at the age of 48. I was still full of life. Rhonda called to say she'd be having pizza at my house tonight. Sally dropped by the office for lunch. We discussed her mother in happier times. We were a family. I know she didn't love her mother very much, but I know she missed the woman she once was. To be honest, we do. We had many enjoyable years together. Well, I believe there was a signal between Sally and Tina when Sally left, because I was called into Tina's office less than five minutes later, and she slammed the door and kissed me as if the sun would never rise again. Although I must admit I may have kissed her in the same way, can I declare you mine now, Arthur? I felt a sore spot on my neck where Hickey might have been when she kissed it a minute ago. I believe you may have already had this dinner. That night was fantastic. Sally, Rhonda, Tina and Clarissa were with me and we celebrated my freedom from Amy that Friday night while the girls were asleep. Tina and I finalized our platonic relationship. I must have done something right because for the rest of the weekend whenever she sat down she squeaked slightly as if she was in pain and her smoldering eyes burned with a fire that I knew was only for me. Six months later we married in a beautiful small ceremony at a local lake attended by many co-workers. We would like to marry later. However, we wanted to make it before Sally and Clarissa's younger brother was born. It was five years later. Sally, her boyfriend Tina, and I had just finished dinner at one of our local restaurants when five-year-old Keegan asked his father, who is this lady who keeps staring at us? We all turned around to find Annie sitting across from us. She had lost a great deal of weight. She looked at us and didn't appear pleased with herself. We have not seen or heard from her since our divorce. She never attempted to contact Sally. I apologized and approached the family. Hello, Annie. Hello, Arthur. How are you doing? She glanced down at the chicken salad she was eating. You were correct, Arthur. You were correct about him. Paul convinced me that I was his soulmate, and you were nothing. But when I didn't get the money right away, he convinced me to gain weight because he loved me and fat women. When I received the money from the divorce, you told me not to give it to him. But I didn't listen. He spent it in a few months, then abandoned me and vanished without ever marrying me. I was still upset with her, but her story did not end well. We share similar beliefs. From then on, I spent every waking moment trying to regain the confidence he had taken away and become the person I once was. She fought back tears as she looked at me after so many years. That expression on her face reminded me of the man I once knew. Arthur, I'm so sorry for treating you like dirt. I did it because I believed Paul knew everything. You didn't realize I'd left the only man who had ever truly loved me. She paused and grabbed the table's edge. You could have died because of what I did. I know you'll never forgive me, but I want to apologize now. She was crying openly. Surprisingly, Sally approached and stood next to me. She also heard her mother's apologies. I looked at her and she smiled tightly and grabbed my hand. I do not know. Perhaps this. It was the first time she realized her mother was truly sorry. Her gaze softened and she extended her hand to her mother, noticing Sally standing there and also extending her hand. Annie panicked and tried to get up and leave, but Sally blocked her way. 
Mom, stop it. You don't need to go anywhere. Sally slid into the booth next to him while I sat on the opposite side. I looked at Tina, and so on. So for the next hour, mother and daughter talked. There were many reconciliations. There were quite a few tears. For once, however, they were beneficial rather than detrimental. After they finished talking, Sally and I brought Annie to the table and introduced her to everyone. I could tell, and he was upset when she discovered Keegan's zaniness after that day. We kind of allowed them back into our lives. Sally gradually reconnected with her mother every week or two. They sipped coffee. Their trust grew slowly but steadily. When Sally married, Annie became the mother of the bride. Tina occasionally invited Annie over to our house for dinner, and at first I assumed it was out of spite for anyone, for all she had given up. Tina benefited from marrying me. Although they were never close, Tina and he had an odd friendship that I never understood. Rhonda never forgave Annie for what she did to me, even though she was always polite to her whenever they crossed paths. And I. With Tina's permission, Annie and I did some post-marital counseling. We have discussed many of our issues since then, more than five years ago. The consultant suspected Annie had one of the issues. However, Annie did not admit it. No. That day I threw away the most important thing to me. My husband loved me, and my daughter wanted to be with me. No amount of hormonal imbalance can excuse the way I systematically destroyed everything good in my life. For someone who whispered sweet nothings into my ear, it was a piece of garbage in the bedroom and we had a manhood so small from the waist down that you couldn't even tell it was inside. She smiled warmly at me. This statement. Arthur and Sally deserved a lot better from me. She cried, then wiped her tears with a napkin. Five years had passed before I was able to reconnect. I lost five years while not with them. I thank God every day that Arthur let me back into his life. Intimate, too. She blushed at the confession. She had every right to hate me, but she always greeted me warmly. No, she was lucky. She took everything I did away and I will pay for it for the rest of my life. Annie benefited significantly more from these sessions than I did. It was helpful to know that neither Sally nor I had done anything to make anyone leave us. And she was correct. Tina picked us up and helped us become a much stronger family. As the saying goes, people pay for their mistakes if they make them long enough. And Paul did just that. He relocated to another state and attempted to steal a married woman and money. But this time, the husband, Paul, accompanied his wife and turned him into the authorities. The husband was sentenced to ten years in prison, but rumors from Rhonda, who now represents him, indicate that he will be released soon. Tim and I have a deep love for one another. I never expected to be able to love him as much and as deeply as I did. But Tina demonstrated that this is not true. Tina gave me not only her love, but her entire soul, without a trace. We still work at her company, and I keep the same job. We have ups and downs, but we never let anything stop us from communicating. Her body still performs admirably when it matters the most, and we make love frequently. We even made love in some exotic locations during our vacation. Usually, one look suffices, and I lock the bedroom door and make love to her. We had just finished making love, showering and getting dressed when we arrived in the kitchen. We discovered Sally and Annie talking. We found out last month that Sally was expecting a baby. There was a buzz in the room as the girls planned for my first grandchild. My God, Sally, these two act like teenagers. Tina, please tell me what you are feeding Arthur. Maybe I can take some of his defeat. Fred, Annie joked. Mom, leave him alone. We all know that Dad was on a mission from that point forward. Sally teased. Since when, honey? Annie inquired. Her eyes sparkled with mischief. I believe Dad's libido has increased three notches since he awoke after being released from the hospital in his previous life and went silent. And so did Sally. Tina blushed for me, and I sat back, grinned at my girls, and felt myself become excited again as I looked at Tina. Then I stood up and walked back into the bedroom. Tina followed me a moment later, locking the bedroom door behind her. Here is the next story. My wife Abby enjoys going to the movies. If I wanted to make her happy, I only needed to take her to a good movie. I couldn't simply take her to any movie. It had to fit into one of four categories. Animation, action, adventure, drama, or romance. Abby also went to almost any movie starring Tom Torino, Matt Wright, or Brad Talbot. They were her favorite actors. 
My first date with Abby occurred when I took her to see Sleepless in Seattle. She didn't particularly like Tom Hanks, but she enjoyed the story. Years after we married, she admitted that she fell in love with me after seeing that movie. Why did she do this? I have no idea. After 12 years of marriage, Abby is still a stunning woman, standing 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighing pound 115. She has a stunning figure in a deep emerald green. The eyes really stand out against her, even here when Abby gets ready to go out. She continues to attract men's attention. My name is John Sylvia, and I am no slouch either. I stand six feet, one inch tall, and weigh pound 180. I've got sandy hair and blue eyes. Abby and I have been told several times that we make an excellent couple. During college, before I met my future wife, I was never without female companionship. However, after meeting Abby, I realized I didn't want anyone else. For 12 years, I believed Abby felt the same way about me. We met during our first year and fell in love. Our love grew over four years at one of the state universities, and we married three months after graduation. Abby is my true love, my soulmate, and my everything. I couldn't imagine living without her. While we both adore our two children, it has to be spontaneous when you're not present. Tonight was meant to be just the two of us. We agreed to go dancing with three other couples that evening. Because we needed to stay out late and drink, we reserved rooms in a city center hotel. My parents and I had agreed to take our two daughters for the night, so it was going to be a truly special occasion. It proved to be something special. Good. However, when we arrived at the nightclub, I had completely different thoughts. I had no idea what was going on, but the mood appeared to have turned sour. The women seemed nervous about something, while one of the men appeared smug. George and Helen are my favorite couples, followed by Bob and Anna. George was a software engineer, and Helen was a stay-at-home mother of three children. Bob ran his own plumbing business, and his wife worked in the office as the bookkeeper. Chad and Velma were the only couple I didn't particularly like. To be honest, I had a good time with Thelma, but thought Chad was a jerk. But Abby and Velma were college roommates who remained close friends, so I had to put up with Chad. According to my understanding, he was involved in the film industry. I believe Chad said he was an agent or something. From what I could tell, he wasn't very successful. But Thelma had a well-paying job as a pharmaceutical representative. I work as a financial advisor for one of the major brokerage houses. Things were slow when I first started my business, but now I have more business than I can handle. My firm's policy is that once you reach a certain number of clients, you must train someone in place, a new consultant with access to your clients. Of course, you keep the most profitable clients to yourself. I've had to do this twice before, and I'm about to do it again. I make a very good living. Abby started working as an administrative assistant for Mike Winston, the executive vice president of a regional bank. One or two girls were born one year apart. Abby became a stay-at-home mom until our youngest, Stacy, started first grade. Then one day, Mike called her and announced that he had been promoted to president and asked if she would be interested in working for him part-time. Abby asked, and I told her to go for it. If you think I made a mistake by letting Abby return to work and now she's sleeping with her boss, you're completely mistaken. Mike is 62 years old, bald, and, most importantly, devoted to his wife and five children. As I previously stated, something felt off, but I couldn't pinpoint what it was, and at the time I didn't care. I was looking forward to spending the evening dancing with my wife in a hall made of love. After that, we scattered around the room because we knew several other couples who were there. If you dance well enough, you will meet some very nice people. One couple was an old college friend, Fred Abbott, and his wife, Brenda. I paused to speak with them as Abby and the others approached our table. I was about to join my wife when the music began, but there was a knock at the door. A crowd gathered at the entrance, then dispersed. Brenda gave a gasp. What is wrong? asked Fred. I don't know who it is. Brenda held her breath. I took another look inside. A very handsome man. He was only about five feet six inches or seven inches tall, but as the women sang, he was beautiful. Both Fred and I admitted our ignorance. This is Brad Talbert, she blurted out. He and his fiancée, Rita Summers, are two of Hollywood's hottest stars. Yeah, Fred said, and he started looking past Brad. I wonder if Rita Summers is also here, John? On a scale of one to ten, Rita is at least fifteen. Brenda lightly slapped her husband's arm. Have a dream about it. When I looked at Brad, I recognized him. 
He was one of my wife's favorite actors. I was wondering if I could get her autograph. But what happened completely surprised me. Brad approached our table and asked my wife to dance without hesitation. She jumped up and danced alongside him for the next four songs. I walked up to the table and sat down, furious. My wife didn't even ask if I was fine with her dancing with someone else. When the fifth song began, I wanted to intervene, but Chad's glass dropped to the floor. He reached to pick up the broken glass. John, could you assist me with this? He asked. I looked at my dancing wife, then chatted. I should have gone to see my wife, but instead I followed Chad into the men's room. However, when I arrived, the cut was very minor, but I helped him clean it and bandage it with a paper towel. When I returned to the table, I only saw my wife leave with Brad. I rushed after them. Chad followed closely behind me as we walked out the front door and into the parking lot. I saw Abby get into the car with Brad. I ran to catch up with the car. I noticed Brad kiss his hand while she was laughing at something he said. Chad kicked my legs. I fell to the ground but immediately got up. What the hell were you doing? I yelled. Brad grins and says, I'm just going to take your wife for a ride. Thelma appeared a few seconds later. This is Abby's dream date. She told Chad and I how much she liked Brad. So we agreed he'd ask her out. This is my wife, I screamed. Didn't you think I should know about this? Abby informed us that you would say no, Chad replied with a grin. Simply go with the flow. You go with this. Flow yourself, I yelled, pouncing and punching Chad directly in the bridge of his nose. The sound of his nose breaking was the only positive thing that night. Thelma then rushed at me, punching and attempting to kick me. Fortunately for me, Fred noticed what was happening and followed me. He quickly pulled Thelma in and positioned her on the other side of him. He attacked my husband. Thelma began screaming. No, he didn't do it, Fred stated calmly. You too attacked him first. He was simply defending himself. Thelma became enraged and dialed 911. The police arrived about ten minutes later and started taking statements. Fred continued his story and I repeated it, adding that Chad had hit me in the legs first. The crowd that gathered after the riots began saw only Thelma attack me. They told the officers that they only saw me trying to get away from her. Chad and Thelma were ultimately arrested. By the time the cops left, I was devastated. I returned to our table and noticed two women smiling. Where is everybody else? Helen asked. Chad and Thelma were arrested after assaulting me. I responded, doing my best to contain my rage. Abby left with Brad and appeared to be very happy about it. This should not have happened. Instead, she had to go outside with Brad, snap a few photos, and then return to the table. My wife and Thelma clearly did not tell you what the real plan was. I said, getting up to get a drink. Fred caught up to me at the bar. Are you going to be okay? He asked. I don't know what's going on, I admitted. I hope my wife just went for a drive with this movie star and will return soon. When she returns will have a very unpleasant conversation. Look, John, Fred said it consistently. I do not want to start a fire, but Brenda informed me that Brad Talbert is a notorious womanizer. He appears to enjoy sleeping with married women. I hope this doesn't apply to Abby, but I believe you should be prepared for the worst. My heart sank. I wasn't sure what to do after telling Fred I'd be fine before returning to the table. I tried calling Abby's cell phone. The call immediately went to voicemail. The atmosphere was extremely off. I felt awkward sitting down. The wives looked very ashamed and their husbands looked furious. I continued to try and reach Abby without success. Finally, two other couples said they were going back to the hotel. I told them I would stay for a while to see if Abby would come back. I waited half an hour before heading to the hotel. I waited there until three o'clock in the morning, calling Abby's phone every ten minutes. Finally, in disgust, I checked out and headed home. I got there around four o'clock and sat on the sofa. I must have fallen asleep because the sun shining through our bay window woke me up. It was already seven o'clock in the morning. I checked our bedroom, but Abby had not returned yet. Then I checked my cell phone and there were no messages from Abby. So I logged into my computer and opened our Facebook page. It exploded with pictures of Brad and Abby leaving a nightclub, pictures of them walking into his house, pictures of Abby walking into Brad's house on his arm. I searched Hollywood websites and they were all blown up by Brad's latest conquest with a married woman. At this moment, I was beside myself with rage. I immediately called my lawyer, and since it was Saturday, my call was forwarded to his home. 
He wasn't too happy about my call until I explained what was going on. He convinced me not to do anything until Abby came home and explained her behavior. Finally, around 11 o'clock, the front door opened and Abby walked in with a big smile on her face. The smile disappeared and she saw the expression on my face. We didn't do anything, Abby said immediately. We just spent the night talking. I know I should have asked you, but I was sure you would say no. You know how much I love movies and that Brad Talon is one of my favorite actors. Last night was like a fairy tale. Nothing happened. John, I still love you with all my heart. I just stared at her and I could almost feel the steam coming out of my ears. I want you to pack up your things and go to your parents. I can't even look at you right now. John, why do you make such a big deal about this? She asked with irritation and slight fear in her voice. We were just talking. There was nothing special about it. It doesn't really matter. This is damn important to me, I said through clenched teeth. I don't believe for a second that nothing happened. But for the sake of argument, let's pretend nothing happened. You still embarrassed me in front of the whole world. Now you're just being overdramatic, John Abbey said, putting her hands on her hips. Outside our group, no one knows anything. And Helen and Anna? No, that for me, it was just a harmless adventure. You stupid, I snapped, which made Abby recoil. I'd never talked to her like that before. This is the top story on all Hollywood news sites. They have pictures of you and Brad leaving the nightclub, heading to his house. And by now... They probably have pictures of you leaving his house this morning. I think our marriage is over, so get your stuff together and get out before I do something I regret. Please, John, I'm sure you're exaggerating. Abby was now on the verge of tears. I love you with all my heart. Sorry if I upset you, but nothing happened. I knew you'd be annoyed, but I thought you'd give me a pass. When you find out nothing happened, we have to deal with this. Then, about the girls... You weren't thinking about your girls when you ran off into the night with your movie star. Idiot, I had dinner. Would you like Stacy or Gail to do something similar when they become adults? Abby turned pale at these comments and then burst into tears. I'm so, so sorry, John. I didn't think it would be so important. I made a mistake. Please forgive me. You're right. You didn't think I was beside myself and getting angrier every minute. I had to get Abby out of the house before I did something I truly regretted. So I left her standing in the hallway and headed to her bedroom. I pulled a suitcase out of the closet and started throwing Abby's clothes into it. I'll do it, Abby said through sobs. After a few minutes, she then slowly packed her suitcase and carried it downstairs. I didn't even offer to help her carry it. I waited until she was out the front door before I slammed the door shut. I looked out the window to make sure she was gone. I saw her put her bag in the trunk and sit in the driver's seat. Then she lowered her head to the steering wheel and began to sob. I didn't even want to go out and console her. I was too damn angry. About 20 minutes later, she started the car and drove away. I immediately called my parents and explained to them what happened. I asked if they would keep the girls a little longer and if Abby shows up. Tell her I have them. They agreed. I was then left to contemplate the ruins of my marriage. I started going over it all back and forth in my head. Abby insisted that nothing happened. Could this be true? I didn't know, but my gut told me she was lying. Can I accept what she did and try to move on? If, as she believed, no one knew about it except our friends. Maybe now that it went viral, I didn't see any way forward for a marriage. I desperately wanted revenge on both of them, but I couldn't think of anything to achieve it. I cried for at least an hour, banging on the walls and doors as I walked around the house. I felt so powerless. I knew I couldn't get back at Brad. He was a Hollywood hotshot, and there was no way I could touch him. And I knew the divorce would hurt me financially. But if it came to that, I was prepared to work from home and sue for full custody of the girls. Since I was obviously the more stable of the two parents, I felt like I had a great shot at it. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, I was just making more coffee when the phone rang. Until now, the media had not received my phone number, but I knew that this would not last long. Hello, I answered the call. This is John Sawyer, and your wife's name is Abby, the female voice asked. Listen, I snapped. I'm not in the mood to talk to reporters. There was a quiet giggle, a bit like the ringing of bells. Okay, said the voice. I hate talking to them, too. Who is this? I asked, fully prepared to hang up. My name is Rita Summers, 
she answered quietly. I think you've already met my fiancé, Brad Talbot. Yes, I know this idiot, I replied. I didn't know where this conversation was going, but I wanted to end it as quickly as possible. Do you love your wife? asked Rita. Her question puzzled me. I exhaled. Despite everything my wife has done, I still love her. However, after everything that has happened, I don't think there's any chance of saving a marriage. I just can't come to terms with what she did. If I could offer you a way to hopefully save your marriage and also save my relationship with Brad, would you be interested? My heart began to beat unevenly. I had to sit down and think. Finally, I answered, yes, I would love to save my marriage, but I just don't see any way to do it. There was another quiet chuckle followed by a sigh. I've loved Brad for a long time. We have known each other since childhood. He comes from a very dysfunctional family like me. His father was a womanizer, and as a result, his mother hated all men. She showed Brad absolutely no love. Nothing he did ever made his mother happy. He had slept with married women many times before. I think this is Brad trying to get the love his mother never gave him. In any case, I come from the same dysfunctional family. Only my family. My mother was a drunkard and my father abused me. Brad was all I had back then, and I loved him to the core, but he departed after his mother divorced his father. I cried for several weeks. We reconnected in Hollywood after we had both become famous. I had heard rumors about Brad and was hesitant of getting involved with him, but the moment we saw one other, we fell in love again. When we were engaged, he swore to leave relationships with married women behind. When I queried him about your wife, he claimed nothing had happened. I can't prove that one way or another. But right now, the fear of losing Brad is driving me insane. Yes, my wife also informed me that nothing had happened. I stated that the fear of losing her drove me insane. Do you believe her now? I do not know. I don't know either. I know Brad, and it would be very out of character for him to invite a woman into his home and do nothing but I suppose stranger things have happened. However, I'm assuming that something actually happened. So I want him to understand the anguish he has caused me, and I want your wife to understand the same thing. I'm not sure if it'll be enough, but I'm hoping that if we succeed, we can move forward with our couples. I'm with you for now. I asked, How are you going to do this? I'm not going to do this alone. We'll do this together, Rita responded, You'll have to spell it out since I don't see how I can help. She added, first and foremost, I want to make the most of what I want to do. I need you to gradually open a dialogue with your wife in order to work toward reconciliation. I'm going to do the scene with Brad. I am not talking to him right now. I'd think in two to three weeks I'll start talking to Brad, and you should allow your wife to move in with you about the same time. I'll let you know when you plan to keep your distance. And you shouldn't sleep with her. Why would I allow her back in the house? I asked. Because as soon as she returns home, we'll have supper together and I'll explain my idea. Rita indicated that she still has some portions of her plan to think about. I was still unsure, but I didn't have any other options, so I went with it. The first thing I did was contact my parents and inform them I would be picking up the girls in half an hour. I immediately called Joni, my administrative assistant, and informed her that I would be working from home for the next week or two. Her voice indicated that she was already familiar with the narrative about Brad in my abbey. She was quite helpful and asked me to let her know if there was anything she could do to assist. I finally called Abby's parents at home. Abby's father answered the phone and apologized profusely. He had heard some of the news reports and felt humiliated, but he was relieved when I asked to talk with Abby. She burst into tears on the phone, claiming she was sorry and wanted to come home so we could talk about it. Listen, Abby, I said gently. I believe it would be beneficial for us to stay apart for a bit. Next week, I plan to work from home. You will have to work Monday through Wednesday. Why not pick up the gals on Wednesday night? Then we will discuss everything. I plan to pick up the ladies on Sunday evening. Thank you, John, she cried. I want to go home right now. I want to be a family again. You do not want us to be a family anymore. I assumed we were a family, I said sadly. But then you made me doubt all I believed we had. I will meet you on Wednesday evening, say, around five. I picked up the girls and explained that Mom would be spending a few days with their grandparents. They asked a lot of questions about why, but the conversation ended when we went to McDonald's. The girls spent two or three hours playing games before we ate dinner there. 
The phone rang shortly as we arrived home. I looked at the caller ID but didn't recognize it when I responded. The reporter asked whether I wanted to talk about my wife's romance with Brad Talbot. I hung up the phone after that. The phone rang every five minutes. I finally got off the hook and simply left him around six. My cell phone rang. It was Abby. Why don't you answer the phone? She demanded instantly because they were only reporters who wanted me to remark on your romance with Brad Talbot. There is no romance, Abby hissed. I told you that nothing happened. Then you must inform the rest of the world since for some reason they do not believe it, I replied sarcastically. There was complete stillness on the other end of the telephone. Abby then requested if she could speak to the girls. So I placed them on the line and sat down to listen to their side of the conversation. They discussed their day at McDonald's. Finally, Stacy handed me the phone and told me that my mother wanted to speak with me. Abby begged again to be allowed to return home. I informed her that I needed more time. On Wednesday night, Abby arrived around four instead of five. I was a little angry that she had ignored my directions, but I decided to leave things as they were. The girls were delighted to see her, and Abby lavished them with kisses. When she approached to kiss me, I backed away. She looked at me with hurt and irritation. So this is how it will be now, she said angrily. If that's the case, perhaps I should simply take the girls and leave. If that's what you want to do, I said calmly and walked away. No, John, Abby said hastily, slightly panicked. I believe we should get down and talk about our difficulties. The girls went to pack their overnight bags after Abby informed them that they would be visiting their grandparents. What are we planning to do? Abby inquired after an awkward silence. I only I knew, I responded. Right now I'm hurt, humiliated, and enraged. Any recommendations about how to get rid of the big three? All I can do is apologize, Abby said, trembling slightly. I made a major error. Please, forgive me. I don't want to lose you, Abby. It is not that straightforward. I spoke while leaning back and crossed my arms over my chest. The entire world stares at me as if I were a cuckold. My wife cheated on me and I did nothing about it. I never intended to hurt you. Abby cried. I was quite thrilled to meet Brad Talbot and tour his home. I knew you'd be annoyed with me, but I didn't expect it to be such a mess. Abby, I want you to know that I genuinely hope we can get through this. Her expression brightened briefly as I said it, but I also want you to know that I've spoken with an attorney. If this leads to a divorce, I want you to know that I will seek full custody of the daughters. I believe you should hire your own counsel. I do not want a divorce. She cried. And I will not let you steal my daughters from me. Abby, I'm not suggesting we'll get divorced, but I think we should consider the worst-case situation, I said, and I don't mean to hurt you. I lied. However, I believe you should keep in mind that given your recent prominence, the court may favorably consider my custody petition. Please do not do this, Abby begged. I will do everything it takes to reunite us. Why don't we simply keep talking, I recommended. In fact, why don't we have lunch next Sunday after you hand over the girls to me? Suppose they decide to keep the girls with me, she remarked angrily. I don't enjoy passing them back and forth. I don't believe it's good for them. If you do this, I will have no choice but to initiate divorce proceedings immediately. Remember, it was you that ruined your reputation. I feel the court will not look favorably on an adulterer. As a mother of impressionable daughters, I cautioned Abby that all of her fighting spirit had drained away. I won't do that. I do not want a divorce. At the start of the second week, I returned to my office. My assistants were quite sympathetic to this. Some of my clientele are not as numerous. Two people in particular thought it was hilarious and began making fun of me. I kindly requested that they drop the subject, but they proceeded to tease me. I have had enough. I informed them that I was discontinuing the connection and transferring their portfolios to another office. Even though they both attempted to apologize, I told them that our relationship had ended. We returned to my clients, and there was no more discussion regarding my wife and Brad. Rita called me at two o'clock in the afternoon. Do you have plans for tonight? She inquired when I made it apparent that. No, I did not, she said. Good, since you'll be joining me for dinner at the Zuzu restaurant at 7 p.m., tie and jacket are necessary. Then she hung up. I was astonished when Rita told me she had a Zoom reservation. Zoom. This is the city's most exclusive restaurant. It typically takes a year to book and is extremely pricey. When I arrived at 7 o'clock, I was shown to a private room at the back of the restaurant. 
There was only one table for two, but the room was very beautifully decorated. There was also a velvet couch. Scenes of various actions on this piece of furniture raced through my thoughts. About five minutes later, the door opened and Rita Summers entered. When I got to my feet, I realized she had literally taken my breath away. I had no doubt that the restaurant would have came to a complete halt when Rita walked in. I estimated she was around five feet, four inches tall. She had beautiful blonde hair, gentle brown eyes, and a body that would make you wild. But her grin drew you in. For the life of me. I could not understand why Brad would cheat on a woman like that. May I call you John? She inquired, sitting opposite me. I nodded and asked, Rita, how should I contact you? Of course, this soft giggle made me smile. We ordered drinks and sat for a while, conversing. I told Rita a little about my career, but largely I told her humorous anecdotes about my children and myself as an awkward adolescent. The waiter then returned to take our orders. I didn't want to put Rita under too much strain, but I was curious about her plans. I was willing to save my marriage, but I had no idea how. When we finished our meal, she leaned back in her chair. First and foremost, John Rita responded with a smile. Chad Tompkins, the cunning snake, orchestrated the entire disaster. He considers himself a film agent, but in truth, he is nothing more than a pimp. He arranges for naive men and women to be taken advantage of by Hollywood stars. You would not believe how many people, particularly married women, get into bed with movie stars by chance. I growled, you're speaking with someone who has first-hand knowledge of this. However, I had no idea what Chad's work was. At the very least, I managed to beat him up. Really? Rita's eyes gleamed. This is good news. But you shouldn't be too hard on your wife. I think Brad could captivate Mother Teresa by removing her panties. As you are aware, your wife is not the first married lady to fall under the spell. I plan to make her the last. And if I can't do that, what I'm proposing will at least make up for the agony he and your wife gave us. I can't guarantee that if my plan is fulfilled, either of us will still be with our loved ones. Despite this, we will feel satisfied that we have avenged their betrayal and smart. Rita's readiness to forgive my wife surprised me, but I was relieved to learn that there might be some repercussions. I just wanted her to explain how we were going to accomplish it. What exactly do you propose? I asked. Before I go into the details, I just wanted to express that you are a very gorgeous and pleasant man. I believe your wife was a fool to jeopardize your marriage. If we met in a different setting, I would be quite interested in dating you. That is incredibly kind of you. But we both understand that we are traveling in very separate worlds. And we aren't only stunning. But more than that, you are stunningly lovely. You're extremely kind. You are correct about our two universes. However, this does not affect the fact that I find you incredibly handsome. Thank you. It was all I could think of to say since I needed to know what the plan was. So, what will we do next? In the next two weeks? I plan to become your client, Rita stated. I apologize. I don't comprehend. Client? Yes. You provide financial advice to your clients, don't you? Rita grinned. Yes, sure, I said. Still didn't see where she was heading with this. Then I intend to invest the money, she explained simply. However, we will need to hold three or four sessions to discuss the agreements. I believe four would be the optimal number. Two of these sessions will take place at your workplace, while the other two will be held during lunch. I will select the seats myself. Okay, I replied. I'm still not sure why I was going to do this. I can start an account, but you must invest a minimum of $10,000. I aim to invest significantly more than that. She said this with a bigger smile. In the meantime, you will not inform your wife that I am a client. You will continue to meet with her to discuss reconciliation. In two weeks, you will allow her to move in. But you won't sleep with her on October 15th. You and your wife will be attending a very important gala event. This will be an evening to benefit the organization I helped start and have been working with for the past five years. Most people don't associate charity with me, which I prefer. I go to charity events every two years. I would not have attended this year because I was at the previous gala. However, I shall be there, as will you and your wife. Okay, I'll join you at the charity gala. I stated that I am certain that each ticket to this event will cost $20,000. I can't rationalize spending so much money. Rita giggled again and grinned. The demon sensation spread from the top of my head to the tips of my toes. 
your tickets will be free. You simply tell your wife that a customer provided them to you. I'm still not sure how this achieves anything I said. I'm starting to become upset. So, John, the escort auction is part of the night's entertainment. Escort auction. Not that type of escort. She giggled again. We sell consenting males at auction to the women in attendance. The woman or guy who will pay the most for a specific person will put a slave collar around him. Then the men are at the mercy of the women who paid for them, Rita joked before continuing. Most of them were bachelors, although married men exposed themselves so that their wives might place bets on them. A married man may be purchased by someone other than his wife. I assume these married males are on their best behavior because otherwise their wives will cut off their genitals. However, during this year's gala, one married man will be auctioned off, and his wife will not be the successful bidder. And what occurs next will not be innocent. My expression remained confused. Rita laughed and rubbed my hand. You are a married man who will be auctioned off, and I will be the winning bidder. So all you have to do is hire a tuxedo, purchase your wife a new outfit, and be my guest. It instantly occurred to me what Rita had planned, and it was fantastic. Brad and Abby would experience what we were going through. Of course, I knew it was all for show, but spending the night with Rita Summers while everyone feared the worst would happen would go a long way toward balancing the scales that would remove my cuckold horns and replace them. Brad. Furthermore, my wife would experience more pain and humiliation than I did. Then maybe we could see a counselor and put this all behind us. The next few weeks went very swiftly. I have to admit that the first time Rita went into my office, I assumed all of the girls present were going to be their parents. Our lunch meetings were placed in extremely discreet restaurants. I didn't understand why we were holding these talks in private. Every essential topic may be discussed at my office. Most of the time, we simply told each other stories. These were fun lunches, and I learned a great deal about Rita and Brad. She adored him, and she would be crushed if they broke up. But she was willing to leave him if he continued his previous behavior. I let Abby come home one week before the gala. However, I informed her that I would sleep in the guest room. She was in pain, but she did not insist. The Wednesday before the gala, when I arrived home with the tickets, Abby's eyes brightened up. She began raving about the celebs who will be present. Then she chastised me for wasting that much money. It cost me nothing, I told her. One of my clients inquired whether I could use the tickets. I imagined it would be a fun evening. By the way, I believe you should get a new dress. Purchase something? Abby was floating through the clouds. I nearly felt bad for her. But then I remembered that evening when I imagined we'd have a great night together, only to appear foolish. It's time she felt my agony. When we arrived, there were already approximately 500 people present when we checked in. There was a table where you could register for the auction. I noticed a line of men filling out forms. There were five very gorgeous males in line. So I turned to Abby. Would you say Abby? I asked, immediately pointing to the table. This is a charity event and we paid nothing for the tickets. What are your thoughts if I sign up and you bid on me? Abby giggled, but not as musically as Rita did. I don't have any money and I didn't bring my wallet because it wouldn't fit in this bag. Regarding Rita's advice, I had money with me. Here's dollar one thousand. I doubt you'll need to pay more than that. However, because this is a charity, you must donate at least two hundred dollars. You are worth eleven thousand dollars and much more, Abby said with a big smile. I waited in line until I arrived at the registration station, where I completed and signed the paperwork. I checked the list and there were approximately 18 or 20 guys signed up. If I hadn't known it was a setup, I wouldn't have had the courage to execute it. Just as I was ready to move away, the woman behind the counter inquired, Are you married? I nodded as she took out another form. I hope your wife is with you, else you won't be able to participate. She needs to fill out and sign this paper. I summoned Abby over and explained what they were looking for. She promptly completed the form. Abby had not read the form, so she didn't understand she had consented. Let me do whatever the successful bidder requested after the paperwork was finished. We went in search of our table and saw a seat and a sign for two starlets, one presenter and two actors from a national soap opera. My wife was filled with admiration not only for the persons at our table, but also for the other celebrities at the gala.
When the auction began, all of the men who had offered to participate were summoned. I smiled at my wife and stood up. As it turned out, there were twenty-four participants, and I'm sure Rita intended to leave me for last. By the time I was the last person on stage, they had raised more than three hundred thousand dollars, and I have to admit that the bidding was lively and fun. Our last contestant is a local, said the announcer, a well-known game show host. His name is John Sawyer, and he is married with two children. I'm sure his wife is emptying out her piggy bank somewhere in there. So what do you say if we start the bidding at dollar fifty? I think it's worth at least a hundred, shouted an elderly woman in front. Can you wash dishes, honey? I laughed and shouted back. I can wash and dry. This caused loud laughter from the crowd. This is more than my husband can do, exclaimed another elderly woman. I'll give you dollar two hundred. Then it became dollar five hundred. Finally, I heard Abby shout, I'll give you one thousand dollars. This caused everyone to rejoice. But almost immediately, the younger woman offered two thousand dollars. Before I knew it, the bid had risen to five thousand dollars. I looked at Abby and she was looking around, completely confused. I just shrugged, looking at her. An offer of ten thousand dollars came from the back of the room. This was quickly followed by another for fifteen thousand dollars. If I had known that it was all a setup, I might have gotten a headache. The bid reached twenty-five thousand dollars and I began to get a little nervous. I thought a few thousand would seal the deal. It was much more than I expected. Finally, from the far end of the room, I heard Rita's voice. I bet $100,000. There was a stunned silence, not only because of the amount, but also because of who had placed the bet. Summers walked down the just below the stage as the crowd roared. She smiled at me. She turned to the crowd and said, And I don't even care if she knows how to wash dishes. Roars and cheers were heard again in the room. I must admit that I blushed a lot. Rita came up put a traditional collar around my neck and kissed me tenderly on the lips from the stage. By prior arrangement, we returned to where Abby was sitting. She was stunned. She didn't know what to do or say. So I shrugged and said, Well, I didn't plan this, Abby, but don't worry, it probably won't happen. Here are the car keys. As far as I understand the rules, I am this summer staying for the next 12 hours, maybe longer. See you at home tomorrow. Rita and I danced several dances at the gala evening. During these dances, she kept beating my ear. I saw Abby watching us with that deer in the headlights look. When red, it took my arm and pressed her chest against me. Walked out of the ballroom with me, I saw Abby's lips tremble. After the gala red, it took me in a limousine to another nightclub. We danced and talked there for an hour. After that, we went to a private screening of the new film. There was no one in the theater except Hollywood. A-list people. The movie I thought was crap. Rita thought so too. But when we talked to the director, we were both delighted with him. The limousine men took us to a very seedy part of town after the car was parked. I noticed that there were two cars parked behind us. Rita explained that they were part of her security team. She pointed to two dilapidated houses on opposite sides of the street. The one with the porch lights still on was once my home. Brad lived in the house across the street. It wasn't such a bad area back then, but it was still pretty scenic. It was already about three o'clock in the morning when we finally reached Rita's apartment. She explained that she has six apartments, one in Hollywood, one in New York, one in Florida, two in Europe, and one in South America. This particular apartment was three stories tall and could fit two regular-sized houses. We entered the office and Rita poured me a drink sitting on a sofa. I started laughing. It's a pity that I didn't have a camera to take a picture of. Abby. I almost feel guilty for doing this, but not really. Rita sat very close to me and put her hand on my knee. John, tell me honestly. Did your wife convince you that nothing happened? None of us will ever be able to prove it. But I believe that in him, I said sadly. That's why it still hurts so much. I know John, and I'm 99.9% .9 sure that Brad had a night with your wife, Rita said angrily at the thought. I think this twist is fair game. With these words, Rita leaned over and kissed me tenderly. I was taken aback by this offer. I just assumed that we would go to Rita's house and sleep in separate rooms. Everyone would believe that we slept together, but we would know the truth. Now she was offering herself to me. It didn't take me long to make a decision. I suppose if I were a better person, I would refuse. But I was still hurt by what my wife did. 
Plus, who in their right mind would turn down the chance to sleep with Rita Summers? We kissed on the couch for about 20 minutes. It was intoxicating to be so close to such an incredibly beautiful woman. Finally, she took my hand and led me to her bedroom. Once inside, Rita began a slow strip tease. It was hard from the first kiss. I wish Abby would do something like that to me. I would love to wake up like this sometimes. After Rita brought me to the finish line, we made love again. Then I looked at my watch and realized that it was almost 11 o'clock. I should have been home by now, I said. Rita laughed at my crazy expression. Remember, your wife didn't worry when you were waiting for her at home and remember nothing happened. I laughed and we took a shower together after drying off and getting dressed. Rita prepared eggs for me while she waited for the limousine to come pick me up on the way home. I finally found peace if Abby had wanted to. I felt like we could now work on putting everything behind us. When I walked into our house, I found Abby crying in the living room. I wasn't sure you'd come home, she said miserably. The news is a buzz that Rita Summers paid $100,000 to spend a night with you. At first, I thought it was just payback. But then I saw the way she looked at you. If she spent that much, she must really care about you. But I don't blame you for what you did. Do we have any future? First of all, Abby, I lied. Nothing happened, I said. She looked at me almost with anger in her eyes. But then it disappeared. Really? Read it as my new client. I told my wife she felt it was fair considering what Brad did to me. Besides, Rita is the one who gave me the tickets. She typically makes anonymous donations of $100,000 each year. This year, Rita made it public to send a message to her fiancé. So, you're right. It was to repay Brad. Whether we have a future or not is entirely up to you. If you're ready to work on our marriage and go to counseling, I'm ready to. Abby ran into my arms and I kissed her deeply. Then I took her to our bedroom. I don't know where I found the strength, but we made love twice. I then went back to sleep until my two girls pounced on me. Around 2 p.m., we had a quiet dinner with the girls. And after they went to bed, Abby and I sat on her patio holding hands. I knew then that we could put the pieces of our marriage back together. Abby and I found a good counselor, Wendy, and she was very helpful in solving our problems. Surprisingly, Wendy was much stricter towards Abby. I assumed that since she was a woman, she would be more sympathetic to my wife. But she pointed out that Abby was planning to take time away from her marriage while I was planning on it. Even though we both insisted that nothing happened, I don't think Wendy believed either of us. Despite this, she said that the simple fact that we chose to leave our spouses with someone was a betrayal. Abby blushed deeply, and most of it, of course. Wendy gave me a pass of sorts because she basically saw my night as Rita's revenge on her fiancé. This was true, of course, but what? When she didn't know was that I was up to my neck in planning and executing it. However, the sessions were very useful. There's one side effect to all this fuss. Abby doesn't like going to the movies anymore. She doesn't even like to watch movies and TV. However, she will go with the girls if they want to go to any children's movie. As for Chad and Thelma, I have dropped the charges against Thelma. I told the authorities that she thought she was protecting her husband, but I allowed the accusations to be made against Chad. He received three months in the county detention center. Chad and Thelma were kicked out of our group, and Abby no longer speaks to Thelma. They had a big fight because Abby blames Thelma for almost ruining our marriage. I won't say that I understand my wife's logic. Rita and Brad got married in the so-called wedding of the century. There were more than a thousand guests there. If you weren't invited, you were nobody in Hollywood. In case you were wondering, Abby and I didn't receive an invitation. However, I did send Brad a wedding gift. I bought a pair of bullhorns and sent them to him with a note that read, You leave my wife alone and I will leave yours alone. I was still mad at Brad when I sent the antlers, but Rita told me that Brad thought the gift was hilarious. He hung them in his office with a framed note underneath. However, since Hollywood is Hollywood, the marriage lasted barely a year. True to her word, when Rita discovered that Brad was again chasing married women, she divorced him. It was friendly, and they are still friends. It's a shame because I know Rita loved him deeply. From what told me about their relationship over the years, I know that they truly had a connection that was much deeper than most couples, but obviously this was not enough. And yes, Rita is still my client. 
When we opened her account, she deposited $1 million. I fully expected her to close the account as soon as her planned revenge was completed, but Rita left it with me when the amount grew to $1.5 million. She contributed another $2 million. I haven't seen her in person since the day after the gala, but I talk to her at least four times a year to discuss her investments. Sometimes she calls with a question about her account, but sometimes she calls just the talk. I enjoy these conversations the most. Rita is a very savvy businesswoman. Surprisingly, she is also quite conservative, at least in her investments. I have no idea what her policy is. Even when I update Rita's portfolio quarterly, we go through her account in about 20 minutes and then spend the next hour or two talking about our lives. After Rita divorced Brad, she told me that she should have left me and left Brad. I laughed and reminded her that we lived in two different worlds. Since then, Rita has been teasing me about keeping an eye on me, and it's her supposed plan that if the stars ever line up so that I'm lonely and she decides to quit playing, she'll do whatever it takes to get me. I know she's just joking, but it's a good fantasy that I keep in the back of my mind. Abby and I are approaching her 10th wedding anniversary. We've had a few rough patches, but overall it's been a great marriage. So far, looking back I am convinced that if Rita had not come to my rescue I would have divorced Abby, and today I cannot imagine what life would be like without her. Yes, and one last thing. Abby is pregnant and we are having a little boy. I can hardly wait for this. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to tell about your or someone else's circumstance, please don't hesitate to contact me. Take care.